I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, the speaker Viv Hutchinson, um, who is the data management coordinator at the US Geological Survey. Um, she works in the Core Science Analytics and Synthesis in Libraries program. She is acting branch chief for the science data management, which is a team dedicated to developing, maintaining, and promoting a suite of data management activities and best practices that support the US GS scientists in long-term management of their science data. Prior to her current position, Viv spent 10 years leading a metadata program for USGS, promoting the use of federal geographic data committee metadata standards by offering workshops, record creation, quality control, and a clearinghouse. She graduated from the University of Maryland College Park in 2002 with a degree in library and information science and joined USGS that summer. Welcome. Um, well, hi, everyone. I was uh, <coughs> telling someone that if it was up to me, we might all be outside. <laughs> I went outside a minute ago. That was a, might have been a mistake. <laughs> It's all good. So I apologize if people were um, at a symposium that was offered at Purdue University back in the fall. I've talked to a few of you that were actually there. And I'll just warn you, I haven't really changed my slides, so don't tell the person next to you what's going to come up next. <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd talk to you a little bit about kind of my thoughts on engaging in culture change and sort of what the fundamentals for working in a data-centric world are and take it from slightly different perspective from some of the earlier speakers, but um, so you heard just a little bit about me. I do live in Denver, Colorado and work for the US Geological Survey and have for quite a while now, um, trying to bring, bring together this whole data management thing for USGS. It's quite an undertaking because there's all kinds of things going on from policies to how do I fit this into my workflow to where do I put my data going on, you know, that um, constantly cause quite a bit of work to, to happen. So it's all very exciting. Um, and today, I thought I would talk to you about a couple of different things. Um, some efforts that are going on in the Data One project, which is an NSF funded um, multi-year project looking at uh, infrastructure for data and looking at community for data and that kind of thing. And so trying to bring together the ideas that are um, culminating in there um, and bouncing them off through the USGS and kind of how that's working as well and how we're contributing to that. Um, and then just some thoughts on creating good data stewards and, and some of the data management skills that, um, that we might sort of be needing from our graduates that are coming out of universities and so forth uh, that we can all help with. Um, skills, basic skills and knowledge for good data management that we've sort of seen working with scientists at the USGS, things that are needed. Um, there's a number of data management assessments that have sort of been going on, and Data One has led a huge effort to try to assess varying communities um, in these kinds of topics, uh, from data managers to librarians. And so I thought I'd show you a little bit of the results of what's come out of that and kind of how we're actually implementing the same assessment over at, at USGS. Um, and then just some educational approaches that we're taking, um, both in Data One and in USGS as a result of all this. So if that sounds good, I'll go along. Um, so Data One is the Data Observational Network for Earth, and it's about it's it kind of kind of concluding its fifth year right now. Uh, Data One is it's led by Dr. Bill Mishner, if you guys know him. Um, but the idea behind it is to provide sort of this universal access to, to science data, particularly uh, environmental and earth science data, um, as well as the community and the tools that, that researchers need to interact with that data. So, um, so the first kind of building block is the community itself. The second one is sort of developing sustainable data discovery and interoperable tools and solutions and then trying to enable uh, science through the use of those tools and having the tools and the data uh, all connected through the community. So that's kind of the underlying premise behind it. Um, some of the principles here is, you know, that data should really be part of the permanent scholarly record and, and it requires some long-term stewardship. So if we're gonna be able to go back and access it and reuse it, we're gonna have to take care of it. Um, the idea of being able to share, share and reuse in order to maximize the value of that data, it takes a lot to collect this data and, 
you know, analyze it and publish on it and so forth. And so we should reuse it as much as we can, right? Um, science is best served by an open, inclusive global community. And then the data environment is dynamic and requires a lot of evidence-based decision making, uh, you know, and practice and governance and so forth. So those are just some of the underlying principles behind Data One. Um, like we heard earlier with RDA, the Data One has a working group model, and so these working groups um, have actually were, were established early on in the project. And now that the project is sort of reaching its fifth year, we're going to look at sort of restructuring it a little bit. But um, they've been quite successful, as you can see this pretty big list of, um, of working groups, community education and engagement, data integration and semantics, data preservation and metadata, and so forth. So a lot of kind of similar topics that are being talked about in, in numerous communities and different groups. But um, very interesting kind of the progress that's been made. So this is a Data One website where you can go and find a ton of resources. So if you haven't visited, I would suggest just take a poke around. Um, there's access to data through many different uh, repositories that are contributing to Data One. We call them member nodes. Um, and there's, a, there's suites of best practices that you can find for data management, and in fact, some educational modules um, based on data management practices as well. And so um, kind of a plethora of information. It's easy to get involved in Data One as well. There's a Data One users group that you can join and kind of dive in and, and help out that way. So anyway, something to keep in mind. Um, and then, so back to this parallel thing with the US Geological Survey. So just sort of basically, you know, USGS is a science organization, and we're really trying to provide reliable science that describes the Earth and various aspects of it, um, mostly through the water, the ecology, the biology, uh, energy and mineral resources and so forth. And so it actually, you know, t it's one of those agencies that kind of touches people's lives. And you may recall there was that giant landslide in, in Oso, Washington, right, recently. And so, um, you know, USGS was right there on the scene working with the Washington State geologists and trying to even just keep those first responders safe, you know, uh, after that, when that landslide was very fresh. So, uh, we're actually headquartered in Reston, Virginia, um, but we are located everywhere. There's science centers in every state and all different types of science centers. And so um, <laughs> the USGS at the moment is organized into seven what we call mission areas. And so you can sort of see what they are up there, climate and land use, core science systems, ecosystems, energy and minerals, um, and so forth. And so. Then we have programs that are within those mission areas that kind of concentrate on different kinds of science. Um, part of the idea here was to promote some interdisciplinary science in USGS. Um, so we were reorganized a few years ago under that premise. Um, so this is just kind of setting the stage for the fact that you know we have all of these science centers and all of these scientists, and they're all spread out, and they're all doing their thing. You know, and how do you kind of make sure that they're talking to one another and they're using you know, similar methods and techniques and that kind of thing um, as they go about their, their science. One thing that we've put together in the USGS is a community for data integration. And it's a um, really interesting community. It's been brought together to sort of look at how can we have this community of practice where people volunteer some of their time to pitch in and think about some of the hard issues going on, you know, in USGS and around. Um, around data integration and, and so forth. And so um, there's about 250 plus people that participate in it. There's monthly calls and speakers and that kind of stuff. But we also try to have um, work going on in, in working groups. So you see the similarities with Data One, right? You, so you pull out these working groups and people kind of tackle some issues. And there's actually even some funding that flows through for certain projects and stuff. So. Kind of an interesting thing. Um, one of the ones that I run is the data management uh, working group with one of my colleagues out of Florida. And we're just trying in that working group to sort of elevate this practice of data management and trying to make it forefront on scientists' minds so they're sort of thinking about it when they're thinking about their research data lifecycle, right? Um, and so that's kind of the, 
the AIM, and we actually bring those folks together that are interested in data management. We talk once a month, we have a speaker, and that kind of stuff in um, sort of more focused areas on data management. So. Um, within that team of people, <laughs> there's even more sub-teams, but just to give you kind of an idea of what we're actually working on, some people are working on writing policy around data management for USGS and actually looking at the life cycle and thinking about what policies do we really need. Some of them are sort of scattered around the policies we already have, um, but this is sort of a concentrated effort to make sure we have some updated things going on. Um, we have a whole team of people looking at data release and what does it mean to release data at the USGS? And somebody was mentioning earlier the um, sort of open data initiatives that are coming down from OSTP and OMB. And obviously, we're very, very involved in making sure that we're paying attention to those things. So how do we do it um, you know, intelligently? Uh, we have an exit survey team, which is kind of you're like, what does that mean? But that, <laughs> that has to do with like, you know, people that are retiring or leaving the USGS, and they're about to walk out the door. And you say, hey, uh, by the way, where is your data? <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, it's in that drawer over there. Oh my gosh. So we're kind of trying to figure out how can we start that process a little bit earlier and kind of looking at, you know, do, where do we need to start? I see you have no metadata about any of your data. You know, <laughs> that's a problem. So anyways, we're trying to just get that under control a little bit. Um, we had a team of people that looked at persistent identifiers and how are we going to deal with that in USGS and for pubs, for data, for, you know, et cetera. So just interesting stuff going on. Okay, so trying to think about what kind of makes up a culture of good data stewards um, and what we might hope for from some of the people coming out of the, out of the universities. But um, so this is a, a slide that Bill Mishner uses a lot in his Data One talks is just kind of reminding us that science is, is everywhere and affecting all of our lives all the time. A um, lot of interesting stuff going on with climate change and so forth. And so um, each one of us is sort of involved in that uh, tangentially. And so with that, obviously, you know, a theme of data at any point, anyone talks about data, they talk about the huge amount of data these days, but the data deluge. And um, we're collecting data from everywhere now, you know. Um, from sensors, from remote sensing, from observations, and so forth. And so there really is, I think someone said earlier, a fire hose um, of data coming in. So, you know, we've got this sort of interdisciplinary and computational and data intensive um, science going on. And how do we sort of handle that? Um, and then, and then, you know, scientists are pretty spread out still. So we saw that in the microcosm of USGS, but it's it's all over the place, right? Scientists are everywhere. Um, so how do we sort of manage that so that we can find this data and use it and so forth? Um, so so one premise is, is it's sort of critical that science scientists place an importance on on managing their data well. And so how do we get them to think that way and and sort of take care about that? Um, because science is becoming more and more collaborative, uh, people are sharing ideas and, and data and so forth. And so it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to share your data if it's managed well. And I'm talking about even in small groups of colleagues that come together, you know, the first thing that happens is, well, I've got this great data set on this and I did that. And like, okay, <laughs> but we have to be able to share it, you know, even in a microcosm like that. Um, so a lot of this stuff is, is definitely gaining attention. Um, so obviously, well-managed data is going to create efficiencies in how science is done. It's going to improve the provenance in the science iteration process. So as, as you go along, what are you doing to your data? Um, really supports scientific re review and integrity, um, improves reproducibility in science, and ensures that integrity of science data assets. Um, maximizing their effective use and so forth. Um, this is just a kind of an email, actually, that I got from a guy in USGS a little while back. We were having a little email exchange about metadata. He's an enthusiast. So of course, I like to keep up communication. Um, but he was just saying, and you don't have to really read this, but basically what he said was, um, you know, he's seen a lot over his 30-year career. And one thing he has seen is, scientists actually brought in to testify 
based on things that they did in, in their science, right, in court. And, and he was just saying it is so great that they had, you know, field notes and data approval records and metadata and so forth when that actually happened. Um, so, you know, he said it's one thing to be questioned by a college student who's working on a project for school, but it's quite another to be grilled by an attorney under oath with the media present. So these are just the types of things that, you know, I mean, it's a real world out there and things happen. And so being able to keep our data well managed and well documented is extremely important. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned earlier the open science mu movement and all these sort of initiatives that are coming down, all this kind of supports that you can hear a lot about that from, from you know, even from the White House and so forth, sort of promoting that type of open openness in data. So, skills and knowledge needed in a data-centric and sharing era of science. Um, well, I kind of mentioned earlier, we have sort of this thing of the research data life cycle and then like a data data life cycle, and you sort of have to think about how those interact as you're moving between them if you're a researcher. So, you know, the, on this side you've got ideas, and you write a proposal, and you do some research, and, and you publish your results, and somewhere in there comes the data, right? And it needs to be planned for, and it needs to be collected and, you know, quality assured and, and described with metadata and so forth. So kind of connecting those dots. Um, Certainly a lot of topics that have to do with data management that are all interconnected and all, you know, you could spend years on any one of these <laughs> doing research and kind of establishing best practices and so forth. But kind of helping people to realize what's involved in, in the data management world. Um, so what do we do about this? I mean, uh, a lot of the work that I've done kind of recently with Data One and USGS is sort of think about the training and the workshops and, and what, the, what the content of those are. And so some of that's just, you know, basic awareness of a science data life cycle. Um, and then a lot of that is best practices in data management itself. And so um, what does it mean to do data management planning and what does it mean to, you know, have well collected, well organized um, collected data? Um, how do I do quality control and assurance and that kind of thing? So just some, some sort of basic topics, I think. And these are the types of things that we've included, at least, in, in some of the training materials that we've put together. Um, how to actually create a data management plan. How to you know, define the contents of your data files. Um, how to actually go about using consistent data organization and so forth. So um, between Data One and USGS, we've come up, and I'll show a slide a little bit later, we've come up with some um, some training modules that kind of at least get you started and you know you guys will be free to use those for sure uh, for any work you're doing in your university libraries and so forth. Um, and so the other key piece to this, which I think someone was talking about even earlier today, is just scientists getting credit for some of the effort that is needed to put into data management. Um, so that the whole idea of data citation is extremely important and persistent identifiers in order to be able to get those, you know, the citations and the credit and that kind of thing. And this is, this is kind of a huge thing that's, I think, developing in USGS, for example, like um, in order to engage those scientists and actually wanting to take care of that data and do something with it, it's going to be critical that we have something in their research grade evaluation for their promotions that's not just about publishing for publishing's sake, right? Pretty important. So that's what we're trying to get. Um, and then, of course, scientists are going to need tools to be able to do this. You can't just <laughs> put out a policy saying, hey, manage your data and good luck. I mean, you have to really um, back that up with ways to be able to do that. And so this is a, a slide from Data One that's actually sort of looks at the life cycle and what are some of the tools associated with doing some of that data management around that life cycle. Okay, so assessment. So, Data management has, um, I mean, data management, data one has worked quite a bit on trying to do some assessments around the community to just try to get some kind of baseline on where we are so that we can see over time, if we do an assessment later on, um, where we've actually gotten to. And hopefully we've moved the dial just a little bit because that's sort of the idea, right? Um, so there was an assessment out for scientists. There was another one for li libraries and librarians that, that was out. 
Uh, maybe some of you saw it, actually. Um, it just sort of helps to define where we're going to concentrate our efforts, right, depending on where people are. So um, this is a, a paper that came out. Uh, Carol Tenefer led and Susie Allard at University of Tennessee um, sort of analyzing the results of some of those surveys. Um, but in terms of the scientist survey, the data one, you know, they found that over half of the respondents said that they didn't use any metadata standard, and about 22% of them said that they just used their own lab's metadata standard. So that's interesting, right? I mean, it gives you a place to, to sort of start. Less than 6% of scientists are making all of their data available via some mechanism. That's not a huge percentage. Um, so that, that's definitely improvable. And then uh, two-thirds report that organizational help and support is lacking. Now, again, not shocking, right? <laughs> but um, but it, it's always nice to know where you're starting from. Um, so one thing that, that Carol and Susie and, and the other authors in the paper were sort of concluding was that there's actually large opportunity here for libraries and librarians to sort of intersect with the, the data issue and the data management issue. And, um, so they did another survey, and they did it for libraries and librarians, sort of thinking about their research data services and where librarians were um, in terms of that, sort of what their views were. Do they, do they think they have enough backgrounds and skills to do that, or do they need more training? Um, you know, what, what is their attitudes toward the importance of that, and so forth. And so um, we got several hundred responses. Um, from a number of different places, a uh, number of different you know, people in different types of positions and so forth. Um, a lot of them, a lot of librarians working in metadata and digital collections and sciences and so forth. So pretty good collection of folks um, answered it. And so they were sort of looking at you know, the role of the librarian and what, what could that be and what, are, what were librarians sort of thinking about this. So, you know, this was just kind of around the life cycle and describing some of the questions that were being asked in the survey. Um, and so some of the few of the conclusions that uh, they were telling me about was, so they had over two-thirds of respondents have provision of RDS as an occasional or integral part of their job. Um, and some have knowledge and skills and opportunity to provide research data services. And then but, they, but librarians believe that they're really important and consistent with the library mission and goal. So that's, that's very important. Um, and then this sort of kind of establishment that libraries are sort of at this early point in RDS and um, having to think about how do we sort of realign and look at this, what angles can we look at this to make this work? And because this is kind of a huge opportunity that we could embrace it, you know, or, or whatever the alternative is. So. Okay, so a number of just kind of basic educational approaches that we've been trying to take based on what we've been learning and assessments and so forth. Um, with Data One, we've done a number of um, workshops over the years at various conferences and so forth, like Ecological Society of America, for example. Um, we usually do about half day. We have different speakers, different people, you know, have different expertise and different parts of the life cycle and so forth. So that's kind of how we approach it. Um, and then each workshop has a sort of a hands-on approach, kind of a component to it. So we try to get people actually working on their computers as well. Um, and then uh, Bill Mishner runs a data management sort of Walter E. Dean Environmental Information Management Institute every year. And so he does this three-week thing. Um, students come in. It's really intensive training on data management and and all kinds of things with working with data. Um, and so people come in with all different kinds of uh, science backgrounds and get a lot of hands-on training and that kind of thing. And so that's sort of an interesting experience for sure that, that they do down at UNM. Um, and then one of the things that the working group that I was working on in Data One, uh, Community Engagement and Education, we went through and um, created sort of some tutorial training modules for data management. So we looked at the life cycle, pretty obvious starting point. We kind of did one module for each part of the life cycle. 
Um, and those are available online. You can download them for free and take them and make them your own. <laughs> if you find them useful, um, lift whatever you need to, because that's what they're there for. Um, this is the sort of the list of topics of what we did. We sort of did why data management and something on data sharing and obviously data management planning. And then so you can see sort of the list here. Um, and what we did was we got these things done and we got them posted. And we sort of had originally had that the intent of like, you know, professors maybe would download a module or two and integrate them into their classes and that kind of thing. But we wanted to see how that would actually work. And so we did this, um, this two-day workshop a couple years ago. And we brought in um, some graduate students and sort of brought them up to, oh, that just appeared, brought them up to, uh, to NCs out in Santa Barbara. And we sort of ta taught this workshop and we used the modules. Um, we sort of assessed where they were before the workshop and we assessed where they were after, see if they had learned anything. And um, as it turns out, we, we learned a lot. <laughs> I think they've, I, hopefully they've learned something too, but we learned a lot. Um, and so one, one thing we learned sort of just from the modules themselves was that we actually needed more kind of real world examples and stories in our, in our slides um, to illustrate important points. Um, and then that we needed to include actually more information and tools and stuff and links and, and things like that. To, even in, in the slides themselves. And then we learned that um, slides created for something to download and use elsewhere might not work quite as well in the classroom. So it's kind of interesting, you know, you put a lot of information on a slide that maybe you just want someone to read, but if you're presenting it, things can repeat, right? So it was interesting to kind of learn that we needed to go back and, and look at that. We had some uh, jargon that came up uh, first, where we didn't have a chance to explain what it was. And so, for example, metadata came up like right at the beginning, and yet we hadn't had our metadata module yet. That was sort of later on. And so, kind of have to, you know, think about how to actually structure this stuff so, so everyone knows what everyone's talking about. Um, we had actually some people with varied experience in, in metadata or in, in data management in general uh, in our classroom. And so, that was another thing we learned was that, you know, even though we really kind of wanted to target those people that had very little experience uh, in this sort of topical area, uh, we ended up with some people in there that sort of snuck in that sort of really knew a lot about it. So it was interesting. Um, it was interesting to have them in the class as well. Um, so information about best practices, and then and as I was talking about, the standalone online lectures can get kind of redundant. If you think someone's only going to download one module, you might have some like value of data management in there, but you might have it in multiple modules. And so we found that that got a little bit repetitive. So we took the lessons learned and we uh, put them on a poster. We kind of analyzed, you know, the results and and uh, kind of be, be able to offer our lessons learned from those um, from those modules. So that's out there as well. And so um, one of the premises of Data One is to, if you're working in a working group or working you know, in that group of people, that it's really great to be able to take what you're doing there and bring it back to your institution, right? And so we've done a lot of stuff in the USGS kind of based on what's been learned in Data One um, and what's going on there. We did have a Data One or a data management training at USGS a couple of years ago. and um, it worked out really well. We actually had it taught by a guy at the Bureau of Land Management, but he came in and had lots of interesting stories to tell and that kind of stuff. And it was mostly because um, none of us had quite, quite gotten to a point of feeling comfortable <laughs> teaching data management yet. So he came in and did that. But what we learned was that um, people really liked it and they wanted us to, to offer a lot more um, training. So we're sort of trying to get there. Um, but it was good to, to know that they thought that that was important. Um, so one thing we did to be able to reach more people quick, more quickly was um, put together this giant website on data management. So um, you guys are free to take a look at this. It's off the usgs.gov uh, slash data management, all one word. And 
again, kind of based on the life cycle itself, we went through and tried to pull out the best practices, some recommended reading, some you know, pertinent tools to, to various pieces of the life cycle and so forth. And so it's pretty chock full of information. <laughs> and um, we are constantly updating that thing. Uh, as you can see here, it, once you start digging into it, there's just all kinds of uh, various topics that are addressed and sort of pretty text heavy, but <laughs> what can you do? So. One thing that we do have on there is kind of based off of this work done at Data One with the training modules, we went through and did, um, last year, we did three sort of main modules to put onto the data management website at USGS. And we worked um, outside of USGS as well. We had some team members from Data One. We had um, some team members from BLM and so forth. So it was kind of a collaborative effort. And we went through and we actually, in these modules, we actually have like scientists on video talking about um, their data management challenges, you know, and sort of how they were able to resolve them or an issue that they ran into and they had to, you know, redo some work or whatever because things hadn't happened the way they thought that they, that it, that they could, um, that it would go. And so, um, so that's actually kind of interesting. So all three of them have, or no, two out of the three of them have, videos of, of scientists and so forth. So, But it really gets into sort of the best practices. You can sort of see over there some of the content. Um, and then the last thing is just um, kind of taking a step back and looking at the policies in USGS. And I was sort of mentioning earlier, you know, some of them are, you know, I just noticed, um, this was a couple of years ago, but I was reading along and it was like, yeah, as we do all of our science collection, you should have metadata with it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, after out of all of these policies and all of this verbiage, and there was like one or two little mentions of metadata. So, you know, clearly there was a need to kind of focus on some of these aspects of the life cycle. So that's what we're working on now. We have a, a data management sort of a foundational policy that says, hey, this is kind of an overarching thing we should be doing. And um, within it, we're writing a policy on metadata, on data release, one on software release. And then we sort of thought about this, and it's like, well, how, is the, how are scientists actually going to get this into their workflow? You know, so we, we actually looked at the data release one and created a use case um, diagram and kind of helped guide the scientists through and who's got different roles and who's approving what and who's reviewing what for... Uh, in, you know, data integrity and stuff like that. And so these are just try kind of things we're trying to work on to kind of help <laughs> help the process and in, in the, under the surface, try to change the culture. You know, it's going to take a really long time, but we think we can get there. So anyway, that is all I've got. I appreciate your time. I'm happy to take a question or two if we have time. Yeah? Okay. Are there questions? It, this isn't a question, just a comment. I, I want to put a plug in and say those uh, Data One training modules are really good. They're, they're very uh, reusable, and I just want to recommend them to everybody. Go take a look, and, and awesome. she's not kidding. <laughs> I appreciate it. Nice comment. Excuse me. Uh, I'm just a little interested in the, um, you talked about having the pre, mid, and post uh, assessments of what you were learning. And I was just interested in how you actually, you know, what mechanisms you used to actually assess that. How did you, you get that data? Oh, for the workshop itself. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, we had a rather extensive kind of survey that we sent out to the people that were going to participate. And then during the class, we actually had them filling out after we'd do two or three sections or something like that. And we'd actually have them fill out another assessment. So it, frankly, it got a little assessment heavy. <laughs> you know, I mean, <clears throat> I could sense that. But, um, but in the end, that's kind of how we were able to do it. it was just a huge number of sort of survey questions and stuff. And 
Um, yeah, and then we just analyzed it statistically afterwards. I, of course, didn't do any of this, but <laughs> someone else did it and sees. Yeah. And I forgot to mention, I knew I would, so I didn't put it on my slide, but we did take the data one assessment for scientists, and we're actually, right at this moment, redeploying it within USGS to sort of see where our own scientists are. Uh, in terms of data management, we've gotten about 250 responses so far. It's still out there, you know, getting people to, to fill it out. But I'm very interested to see what, what that's going to look like. You mentioned uh, when you were uh, doing the initial testing on the education modules, you said you brought in a teacher from the Bureau of Land Management mm -hmm. because nobody, quote, felt comfortable. And it's something I wrestle with all the time, so I wondered, um, why didn't you feel you or anybody, and what, what did you need to do to feel more comfortable teaching? Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, well, so this guy, particularly from Bureau of Land Management, had just had a lot of experience. He had sort of already been teaching this stuff. He had all these stories in his head. He had all these kinds of, he knew all the sort of federal laws and rules that went along that needed to be conveyed. and so. My background has been heavily focused on metadata, and sort of I personally have just recently kind of expanded in the last few years to kind of learn more about the data management. And that was done back in 2011. So at this point, I've learned a lot more. And so I think it's just a learning process and sort of getting your hands on as much information as possible. I think putting actually putting together those training modules at Data One and in the USGS has helped immensely. Because you know you have to do the research, and then you have to figure out well what is it that's the most important that we need to convey to people, right? And so um, I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is like you know, if you so I've always felt like I would love to shadow a scientist for four or five months, right? <laughs> Just kind of go out and help with data collection, help with data analysis, and that kind of stuff. Because sometimes I feel like if you do something yourself, you learn it better more thoroughly. And so I think all of those things are what leads to kind of having the confidence to be able to do it. I think we're more at a point now where we could definitely put on some training and that's coming. <laughs> that's our next step. So. We, we kind of work in an agency context also and this is the kind of work we would like to do. Um, one thing we are working with is trying to get buy-in by people that actually say it's okay to do that. So this is management. Um, upper management. Of course, you can make the case by doing a good job, um, but how did you make the case or make the argument? Ah, well, <laughs> so that's another interesting question. So I think the big key to this whole thing has been, in the USGS, has been our Community for Data Integration. It's sponsored by one of our associate directors. I mean, the next person up is the director of the USGS, and so, you know, um, I think Having him as a sponsor for this community, working on these types of things has been kind of huge. Now, that being said, there's still um, really interesting kind of things that happen. I think we've, we've come a long way before OSTP and OMB even put out, say, these open data initiatives, right? Because that happened about a year ago. Um, and so we had already sort of laid some groundwork for all of this stuff. And we were in a really good position when all of a sudden OMB and OSTP came down with these things saying, hey, you need to make your data more accessible and you know, you need to do X, Y, and Z in order to do that. And I was like, oh, good, okay, well, we already have like some mechanisms to help our scientists with that. But that being said, you know, um, for example, writing some of these policy chapters, it's very interesting. So I've been kind of doing metadata workshops and training scientists for years, right? And so, yet yeah, we haven't had a policy because there's been an executive order. But in this policy, we send it out for review. So this is just a story. So we send it out for review. Well, it went to the executive leadership team at the USGS. It was just very interesting to see the types of comments that come back, you know, various comments pointedly at the policy. And it's like some of them are so supportive of this type of thing and think it's the greatest thing ever. And, you know, others of them are like, wow, an unfunded mandate, you know, how are we going to do this? You know, just like all these. So you kind of have a mix, and I think it's a really slow process. And for us at USGS to be able to use kind of the, the ground, working from the ground up through this community for data integration, that's really helped because then we can kind of meet 
management and you know scientists and whatnot halfway, right? So it's kind of a combination of interesting factors going on there. But yeah, it's a good question. I was fascinated by your um, comments about your exit surveys, oh. and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I also was, what does that mean? Yeah. So what is that process? How do you identify people who are retiring? Are you talking to them oh. how far in advance of their retirement? Are you ending up having to work with them after they've they retire. <laughs> How do you get, because I imagine that it takes a fair amount of time. I mean, I think we all know that one of the goals is to start people early in the collection process to be managing it well. So you really are talking about people who've been doing all this work and haven't thought once about data management, and now you're trying to figure out how do I, how do I understand right. your data? And, exactly. and so what, what is the, can you talk a little more about what that process and timing is like? I can. I mean, it, so we're very early in the process yeah. of trying to figure it out for the USGS. Like, so literally forming this little sub-team working group was sort of step one. But what happens is, you know, we've got these scientists in the science centers and everybody's pretty dispersed. and. You're right, like they haven't been practicing these data management practices necessarily, because they, you know, they haven't had to. I mean, we've got the publication, which is the critical, crucial piece of what they're doing in their jobs. And so I'll just tell you, like one time I was at a science center down in Florida and I had taught this big workshop and the next day I was sort of meeting with little groups. And stuff. So I was sitting with this one scientist and he just kind of interrupted me or something in the middle of our conversation. And he just like whips open his desk drawer and he was like, do you see all this in here? And I look down, there's like all these data sticks and CD-ROMs and oh my God, floppy disks. I mean, it was unbelievable. And like the drawer was pretty deep. And he goes, this is my life's data. This is my life's work right here. And not anything, there's no metadata here <laughs> at all. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, because that, that, this is what goes on. And then, you know, we have an archivist who tells stories of just receiving large boxes. And sometimes he receives those large boxes, you know, after a USGS retired employee has passed away and that the wife is cleaning out the garage. Oh, <laughs> here's all these, you know, big VHS tapes and whoever knows what else. It's like, wow. So, so we just, it's just very important to try to figure out that process. Obviously, <laughs> we're trying to get at it from both angles. We're trying to get at it from, hey, let's get data management into your research data life cycle and sort of work on how we can do that properly. And so we've got a number of things going on there. But the, the part about the retiring, you know, and leaving everything in the desk drawers. So we're trying to just align an exit survey that could perhaps be <laughs> implemented, like you're saying, a little earlier than just the day before you're retiring. The original idea came out when people were, you know, you have to like turn in your keys and there's a whole checklist of things where they have to say your badge and this and that. And like, you know, amongst that, it's, oh, where's your data? <laughs> so we, we can't be doing that. We got to like start. But it's sensitive, right? Because, you know, not everybody's ready to retire or whatever. And you can't just assume things. And so we'll see. Well, I'll tell you how it works out <laughs> in the end. But it all goes along with records management, too. So we have huge records management disposition schedules and stuff like that. And so we're trying to weave those things together a little more prominently. So. Are there other questions? questions? Mark has a question. So you talk I'm sorry. You talked a little bit about um, how you've been learning sort of along, and you know, there's a bit of a learning curve, I think, for many people in oh, this. Yeah. How about for the, the scientists you work for or the people you work for, what's their learning curve looking like? Do they sort of see this and feel like, okay, I understand and I've got it, or is it um, really a, a sort of a more difficult process, maybe with some more than others? Oh, no, well, it depends on who they are. Like, some of them are very open to learning about these things or to engaging in the process. Some of them come up to us in our program and they'll be like, I'll be the guinea pig, you know, practice on me. And so I had a great time last fall working with um, a scientist doing wind turbine uh, data collection on where all the wind turbines are and sort of integrating all these big data sets from various places, right? And um, and, and what was interesting was I came in at the beginning of the process as they were sort of thinking about how they were going to go about 
doing this giant GIS project and, and so forth. And so I was able to say like, hey, let's start the metadata record early and let's actually write a data management plan and kind of follow through on it and see what where that takes us. And like, let's think about where we're gonna post this data when you're done and how we're gonna put a DOI on it and that kind of stuff. And so, um, so I was actually able to walk through that process with him. Uh, you know, some of them are just sort of out there doing their science how they've always done it, and they may not even know that, you know, this big community for data integration is happening, you know, there's, so there's some of that that goes on. Um, but I think, I think it'll be interesting once these policies hit the books and <laughs> kind of comes down from the director of USGS, oh, there's new policies out, and like, pretty soon it's going to be like, how do we do this, you know, so I think, I think we'll find out what the learning curve is. Uh, as soon as that kind of starts to happen, but yeah, so it's kind of the spectrum. <laughs> so just if you can comment on this, and I don't know um, within the scope if you can, so there's, you know, you're in the geological survey, and as we know, there's institutional repositories, you know, institutions that are building repositories to put maybe their researchers' data, but there's also subject-based repositories out there. Is there, do you have an opinion on those? If a researcher should be depositing it with a subject-based one versus their institution? Oh, do you know what I mean? That's a good question, actually. I hadn't really pondered that <laughs> as much. Um, it's a difficult question, sorry. It, I, it but is. I wanted to I could ask really, if you. I could see pros and cons to both, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, from my perspective, from working for a federal agency, um, you know, I, I think it's rather important that we keep our federal data accessible, but um, curated within the USGS, for example, right? But um, but I don't know how other institutions necessarily view that, if it's from an institutional point of view or from sort of a data type point of view or data subject. Um, that's an interesting kind of question, for sure, yeah. Well, thank you, you guys. Very nice, good questions and stuff. Appreciate the time.